So you guys have heard of this disgusting, degenerate place called New York City, right? I've never been, though I want to go. You know, I've heard nothing but nasty things. I hear their subway system is run entirely by rats. I hear that their mayor is homeless. I hear that people have to use gigantic, cartoonishly tall piles of trash bags to access their uh, higher-level apartments that they pay $8,000 for for a single uh, bedroom and kitchenette. You know, I hear a lot of negative stuff about New York City. But the other day, I actually saw a bit of good news about New York City. Um, oh, it is also stinky. That I've heard from a lot of people. Which is this. From one of the best urbanist accounts on Twitter, Hayden Clarkin. A decade ago, New York City introduced planters and chairs to reclaim space from cars in Herald Square and on Broadway. The pedestrian and bike-only spaces have been so successful that New York City is making it permanent. This all started with some planters and chairs. So this is an experiment that I've seen play out in a lot of cities recently, where basically you will have this, um, you will have an area that should be fully pedestrianized. Like with the number of people who walk around this area of New York City, there should just not be cars here. There, there just should not be cars here. There's no reason why they should exist here. You know, they experimented first with reclaiming a bit of space. They put out these, see the fence and the planters and the so on. Um, and oh, well, where will that go, right? And look at this, folks. Uh, this is a, 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 a 3D render, but they're talking about making it permanent. So this is like the space imagined as like more of a third street promenade kind of thing. Even, they've even kept a road back here, so it hasn't even completely taken from cars. Um, but the idea is like, where are you going to go with this, right? Here, let me, to show you a real life example, um, Third Street Promenade. Unfortunately, Third Street Promenade in Santa Monica is currently dying because uh, brick and mortar stores are dying and all retail space costs $1 trillion a second to occupy. But in the middle of Santa Monica, which is part of Los Angeles, which is one of the most car dependent cities in the Western Hemisphere, uh, Third Street Promenade is a completely pedestrianized uh, stretch of about five blocks or so, five or six, that runs from the Santa Monica Outdoor Mall basically down to the waterfront. And uh, back before COVID, back before the bad times, uh, this place was really popular and always happening. Really big and robust, lots of space for people to walk around. There's a ton of research on the um, business benefits of pedestrianized spaces. You know, people always talk about how you need parking spaces to get anywhere or to stop anywhere, but in reality, if you think about it, like, if you have, like, a business downtown, and it has street parking right in front of it, how many cars can you fit in the street parking in front of a business in a downtown area? One, maybe two? Maybe three, if it's a big business? You know? Compare that to the comparative amount of access offered by a pedestrianized space. I'm pretty sure there was a study done, and I think that this has been cited in a Not Just Bikes video, a study was done on the amount of business lost due to the removal of street parking in front of a business compared to the benefits of uh, pedestrianizing the space in front of the business. And it was something like the businesses made like 50 times as much money from the pedestrianization as opposed to what they lost from not having the parking spaces. Like an ungodly amount, you know? Like, think about it. For all of human history... This was what going downtown looked like. Literally, for all time, all of human history, going downtown or going anywhere or whatever, like, oh yeah, time to go to the big town square where there's lots of people and you can just walk wherever you want. People love spaces like this. That's why apartments in areas like this cost trillions of dollars a second to occupy. I really do like how all these photos of Third Street Promenade are like post-COVID, so they look incredibly desolate, whereas I remember it back when I was a kid and it was constantly busy. There were always street performers here, and there were like crowds of hundreds around some of the good ones. Can I get a pre-2020 photo, please? Here we go. Thank the Lord. This is what it looked like all the time for decades. I mean that, I'm not exaggerating. Oh, yeah, here we go. Here's stock footage of it just chilling. Cars can cut through um, laterally. Too many people for me? Well, that's life. You know, it's beautiful Los Angelian weather. You'll get used to it. Hello, Pigeon. Wow, is that my desk you're on? Pigeon, Pigeon, 
Did you know your food costs money? Do you know what money is? I have a job, pigeon. The pedestrianization of spaces is a huge part of reclaiming urban areas that have been blighted with car-centric infrastructure. There are so, like a good a good example would be the I'm trying to remember the name. Is it uh, 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 in Tokyo the Shibuya district? Is that the one that I'm thinking of? The famous shopping district. It is. I've been here because I'm cultured. I can't even make a wealth joke because I came here off of my saved up like minimum wage salary. So the Shibuya district is an incredibly famous shopping district where I couldn't buy any clothes because the Japanese are tiny. Uh, they exist off of nothing but seaweed and rice. And my corn-fed beef American body uh, just could not fit into their clothes. Seriously, I was like 180 pounds back then. Like I was skinny, skinny for my height. And it was just like shoulders. My shoulders couldn't fit in them. Anyway, the Shibuya district... Um, is incredibly heavily trafficked. In fact, you've probably at some point in your life either seen a real video of or an anime drawn rendition of people crossing this uh, X-shaped intersection. It's a cultural touchstone in Tokyo. Why are cars allowed in this area? Persona 5? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm genuinely asking. Like, think about it. Like, let me, hold on. Let me, just to, just to make it clear. Like, how many people are walking here? Why is two-thirds of the travel space in this area dedicated to cars? It's insane. Look at this. Look at this. Look at this. This is insane. No audio. There's the famous dog statue. Look at this. Look, look at this. Look at, look at hundreds of people, thousands of people. Piled onto the crosswalks, waiting for car. It's insane. People don't generally drive in this area because everyone knows it's a walkable district. People walk here. So then, like, like oh, yeah, everyone waiting. Like, a fucking five trillion people waiting. Oh, man. Truck. Look, there are, like, no cars either. Like, at least New York City has cars. Like, New York City is, is dense with traffic. But here, it's like, oh, man, dude. I better wait for car. Waiting. Waiting. And now, the actual fucking users of this intersection come out here. And five trillion... The entire population of Japan descends upon the crossing. It's so many people. And it's like this all the time. Averaging two and a half thousand people crossing here every 3.3 minutes of the day. Two and a half thousand! Like... This is kind of like a subset of capitalist realism. I guess it's like, I don't know, vehicular realism? Where people don't think it's possible to have city environments that don't have cars. They get used to it, you know? I guess it's an attraction for tourism. No, no, no. There is no reason for it to be like this. Like, seriously, there's, like, no reason. People think, like, oh, there must be a reason. No, it's inertia. People just have gotten used to cars being the dominant mode of transportation in urban areas. So it takes a lot of bravery, I think, for, for people to go, like, no, actually, we're reclaiming this space from vehicles. But they should, because it makes sense, you know? You see that post on Reddit, what did Roman parking lots look like? Very high quality uh, concrete is what they look like. Um, like it, a lot of people can't even realize there are so many things that you can do to, um, to take space back from roads that just makes life better for everyone. Um, a good example of this would be, um, guys, what is it called when they introduce curves into a road in order to slow people down, but the curves are just, like, totally artificial? Like, they literally just build into the road to force drivers to slow down. Does anyone know? There's a term for it. Um, I know traffic calming is the generic term for a, a couple of things, but there's a specific name for that kind of construction. No, not a roundabout. Okay, we're just going to look up traffic calming. In fact, I'll look up traffic calming uh, Seattle to see if we can't find something that I have dealt with directly. Roundabouts are a part of traffic calming. Um, yeah, it's like this. Wait, oh, please, let me find a good example. Chicade? Is it a chicade? Okay, 
To a lot of people, this seems insane, but hear me out for a second, okay? Um, speed limits are dumb. And the reason speed limits are dumb is because speed limits in practical terms are basically set by the, uh, uh, the environment people drive on. If you give people like a giant open road that they can run down at basically any speed, they will run down at that speed. Uh, it's an incentive structure thing. The purpose of stuff like this is to force people to slow down in residential areas or when you're near like schools. And it works really, really well. First of all, you can put some cute plants there, and that's always good. But also, the fact that it restricts movement and sight lines um, basically requires you to go about it for like 10 miles an hour, and it works. It literally, it actually makes people safer drivers. Because if you have a row that's like this, here, strode near school. Even Beverly Hills had shit like this. Let me see if I can find a... Honestly, I feel like the road that was right next to... Um... The middle school that I went to in Beverly Hills would have, like, fucking worked on this perfectly. Here we go. If, if you, this isn't a school, but it's like a big building show. If you have roads that look like this, right next to residential areas, or right next to schools, people are going to zip down this at 50 miles an hour because there is literally nothing stopping them from doing so. Whereas if you build out into the road, not only is the road more beautiful because you have more space to... God, look how beautiful the street is. Isn't it lovely? Um, not only do you have more to work with, um, uh, uh, but additionally, you know, you 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 keep people from from zipping down. Efforts to do this have been popping up all over the Western world lately, and presumably other less important parts of the world. And it's really, really, really important to celebrate this kind of stuff because every time anybody makes this like city or our city or whatever slightly better, a bunch of eighty-five-year-olds who live in the suburbs crawl over to their local town like council meeting to talk about how, even though they personally weren't using them, they are deeply offended by the loss of the 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 lane that was turned into a bike lane or whatever, you know. Um, it's so, so, so important to keep talking about it. Pike Place Market just did this. Wait, did, ha, wait, 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 Has Pike Place Market finally banned cars? No way. I'm seeing a car-free Pike Place Market in 2023 looks doubtful. Okay, so Pike Place Market is a perfect example of an area where a half-assed attitude towards pedestrianization has fucked over everyone, Okay. Pike Place Market is probably the most famous landmark in Seattle next to the Space Needle. You have seen influencers take photos in front of the market sign. Everyone has seen this. It's very famous. It's a great market. There's lots of cool stuff here. Lots of fresh fish. Not that I like fish food that much, but lots of other people do. Um, but for some ungodly fucking reason, presumably to make it easier to like bring goods in, but there are so many better ways of handling that. For some ungodly reason, you can actually drive and park in Pike Place Market. This area right here is like God's gift to potential pedestrianization. All of the businesses here are operating under a specific zoning code that prevents them from having um, any like, they can't be chain stores. So if there's a store here, it has to be the only one. There, you, you can't like open a Popeyes here. Everything here is unique. The Pike Place Market itself is packed full of really unique businesses that you can only find there. And yet, for some reason, the main beautiful brick avenue through which a person would access all of these businesses is not only open to both sides street parking, but you can also drive right through it. This is psychotic. Absolutely psychotic. I gen like Nobody likes this. Nobody who walks through here likes being confined to this tiny sidewalk while this big, wide, open, deep red brick uh, 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 walking path is, is like, like, this clearly isn't meant for cars. But cars are allowed here. That's what I mean about pedestrianization. Look at this. This is from on the ground. This is what it's like day after day. Thousands of people packed under these tiny awnings. Right over there, by the way, right over here, this building, that's the first Starbucks. The first one. Before they got huge and spread out everywhere, their start was right here in Pike Place Market. There's always a huge line right in front of it. Um, all the people packed right here under the awnings. And meanwhile, three times the width of space is taken up by cars that aren't moving because, and this is another cool traffic fact, did you know that a large portion of traffic that you encounter day to day in both residential, commercial, downtown, industrial, whatever areas, maybe not so much industrial, non-industrial areas, 
a lot of that traffic, sometimes as much as 50%, is just people circling around trying to find uh, cheap street parking. A significant portion of traffic. That means that if your kidney just exploded and you're driving to the hospital, if you've got a bus to piss and you're trying to get back home, if you've got frozen groceries that you're trying to get back home or whatever, all the stuff that you would actually like want to move quickly in a car for, sorry, bucko, a huge portion of traffic is just people trying to find cheap street parking. I would venture a guess that over here in uh, Pike Place, it's probably more like 90%. Because the only reason people would ever drive through this is to find the incredibly convenient street parking right next to the specific business that you want to run into. But there's never any space to do that, is there? Because there's 5 million people who want those spaces, and there are only like 15 spaces. They cut down the pedestrianized area for like 15 spaces, so there's no room to park. So this just turns into its own parking lot where people slowly crawl along, barely allowed to move forward because of the constant stream of people crossing the streets over here that you would use to like get back into the main through fare. It's insane! The closure just happened in June. Small stretch of Seattle's Pike Street closed to vehicles. I want all of it closed. I want cars to be made illegal. Death penalty. But I'm glad for any positive change. The idea to close Pike Street between 1st and 2nd Avenues will create more space for people to... Between 1st and 2nd Avenues? Oh! Guys, I'm sorry. This isn't them closing Pike Place. This is them closing Pike Street. Pike Place remains fully car accessible. What they've done is they've taken Pike Street, which follows up perpendicular to First Avenue, which is where you get to Pike Place from, and they've uh, they've closed it down to cars, which I knew that. I've driven by there and saw. But there are a lot of Seattle roads that are like that. I mean, hold on. Seattle, Pike Street. Can I get, like, a recent image of it? Yeah, here. I do support this. Look. Aren't those really cute planters, by the way? Normally when cities block off areas, they just throw some half-assed planters. But those are some nice planters, and I respect that. Those are expensive. Yeah, they, they closed it off, and now this whole area is kind of just like a free, a free walkabout a little bit, which, which, I, which I think is nice. But it is literally one block of pedestrianization. It's, it's not a street, it's one block of one street. So we're talking about the slightest, most incremental gain, you know? But any gain is a gain. You know, I'm mostly channeling this through, like, Seattle, because that's what I'm familiar with. But there are lots of examples of um, of this general practice. Vosh, you know that a lot of America is way too rural to ever be car free. Most, I'm mostly talking about cities here, but also like I like fuck that attitude. Frankly, um, the, the world 150 years ago was more rural than it is today, and it was also completely car free back then. I think that towns that only have a few thousand people can still be walkable. If you want examples of that, look at, like, German villages, you know? There are villages that were made back hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and nowadays there's still nice places to walk around, um, purely because they weren't designed as, like, like highway off-ramp trash. There is a better world out there. We can do it, okay? I think another good example would be the selective pedestrianization that's been done on um, uh, Seattle... University Row? Is that what it's called? University Row? No. University... Guys, what's that shopping district called? With all the, uh, hey barbecue? University Square? U District. That's it. U District. Thank you. Thank you. Right next to Washington University. Huh. That's odd. Not that many photos of it. Yeah, whatever. Right next to the Washington University. And the Washington University is gorgeous, so it encourages a lot of walking in the area. UW is so pretty, man. The campus over there is just insanely nice. It's funny seeing college students leave their nice urbanized environments to hellscapes in the USA. Dude, this is why people idealize college, okay? This is the reason. People idealize college because it's, for many Americans, the only time in your life that you'll be living in an area that is walkable where you get to, like, see people around you and socialize in environments that have been crafted to allow for socialization. Nothing about that, nothing, is inherent to universities. Universities are just the only places we've done it because the constraints of universities have made them pack everything together into a relatively small space. It just wouldn't make sense to ask every student to get in a car and drive from one building to another when it's all on the same campus, you know? Like, efficiency demanded 
pedestrianization in most universities. And you know what? It's been better for it. And we could have that everywhere. Yes, I have watched Jay Foreman's videos on cycling in London. Literally all evidence we have favors pedestrianization. Uh, 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 biking, pedestrianization, all of that. Like, all the evidence we have in the table says that this is better for everyone. Um, we just don't do it because, again, it's like capitalist realism. People are so used to cars that they don't think there's anything outside of it. Evidence has never stopped the right before. Unfortunately, it's not just the right here in this case. Um, it, the, the inability to imagine our cities outside the context of constant car usage is not purely a, um, a conservative thing. It's, it's a broad issue. Can I, like, show that one area of the U District that I like? Where is it? Where's that one little road? Find it. Find it for me. Nope, not this one. Hate that this area has cars at all. What the fuck? I didn't ask for that. Show it to me. Where's the goddamn... Where's the goddamn taco seating? Where is it? Huh. I think that these photos were taken before they made that change. They pedestrianized one of these roads. They made it so that cars can't go down it. You can just walk down it. It's this one. Oh yeah, here we go. But they changed it even more. It's by the light rail station? Yeah. Oh man, it's so pretty. Just having just having a road like this, you know? Like even something simple like widening the sidewalks and just having some benches out goes so much like it goes such a long way towards making people feel more comfortable using those spaces. This pick of a town next to my hometown, these tents were up for an event and shut down all the roads, but otherwise cars take it up one hundred percent of the time. Yeah, like Anytime anything is pedestrianized, everyone immediately agrees that it's better. Like, it's it's so obvious. It's just so weird that, like... It's just so strange that so much of our city's transportation networks are inaccessible to humans, the species that we are. You know? It's difficult to comprehend, Mistress Lynn. Have you seen the waterfront rework in Seattle? Yeah, but it's still ongoing. There are just so many good examples. 10 best pedestrianized streets around the world. No, fuck around the world. I want America, bitch. Everyone knows that, like, Paris is walkable, okay? I want, I want good examples of what things can be like over here in the good old U.S. of A. These aren't the examples that I'm looking for. This is just, like, people having nice parks. Nobody even knows what pedestrianized means. Like, here, pedestrianized streets, America. There we go. Yeah! This is what I'm talking about, baby. Downtown Mall, Charlottesville, Virginia. Wow, what a what a nice town. I wonder if anything bad ever happened here. Were those before after photos or whatever? You know what I'm talking about? Like here in Times Square. These photos aren't lined up very well. But I stand by the principle. Oh, Third Street Promenade. Can I get better comparisons here? Um, before after comparisons, pedestrianized streets. I want a giant, like, fucking compilation of these, is what I want, personally. Ooh! There's Pearl Street. I will admit, it still looks ugly as sin in the after here. Um, but, like, holy shit, dude. Still an incredible improvement. 2012 to 2014. That's a pretty big dub. It's, it's important to understand that while this is good for humans, because humans need spaces for humans, it's also important to understand how economically beneficial this is too, you know? Those areas with the gigantic wide strodes out in suburbia where people drive between their, like, McMansions and the strip uh, office malls where they work at, those areas are a massive drain on city resources because maintaining all that infrastructure just so some dumb fucks can drive their minivans between, like, home and work uh, where nobody, like, walks around or does anything. It's, it's a drain on the economy. But, like, look at how much more potentially productive this area looks compared to this area. What, what can you do in this area? Okay, so you have some, some, some umbrellas here that people might have some food under. And all of this, all of this gray nothing, is just a big inaccessible blob that people use to zoom fast, you know? And now over here, like, this area, 
this could be like a spot, you know? Like this is now a place that people can refer to. What is this in the public imagination? What will people say about this? Oh, this is the intersection of retard and fuckabout streets. Oh, great. Okay. Well, what do people say about this? Oh, man, dude. That's fucking, that's fucking fuckabout square. Holy shit. I love the tacos or whatever. I don't know. People can't conceptualize this as anything other than a through fair because that's all it is. Why are they British? I don't know. I was channeling um, uh, the, the not just bikes, not, not just bikes, the uh, unfinished London there a bit. And I did just watch one of those videos the other day, which is probably why I'm still lingering on this, even though we're 45 minutes of the stream. I just think it's important, okay? Oh my god, look at that. Yes. Force all cars to go through the shame tunnel so that everyone can throw tomatoes at them and scream shame as they drive through. I think this hasn't gone nearly far enough. There should not be street parking here, okay? However, even this is a significant improvement, you know? Um, I think if anything, this is a really strong indication of how much, um, enclosing can do to make a space feel better. People like having spaces, even outdoor spaces that are well proportioned, that gives a sense of, of, of enclosure, uh, help them feel like they're in a distinct area with a unique and vibrant identity, as opposed to just another sun blighted spot on this earth. This is all open. And admittedly, a lot of that has to do with the leaves and the trees, of course, but more effort has been made to enclose this space, to make it feel personal and significant in its own way. Oh, this article has exactly what I was looking for. Before and after, 30 photos that prove the power of designing with pedestrians in mind. The main thing that people have to remember when it comes to transformations like this is that pedestrianizing one street is not enough, you know? It's like how people will say, oh, wow, no bicyclists are using our bicycle lane, even though we spent $2 million on it. Which is like, first of all, you spent $8 billion on your highway, so shut the fuck up. And second of all, like, $2 million is nothing for a city budget. That's not enough to, like, meaningfully orient your city towards pedestrianization. That's, that, that requires a lot of investment. Small changes, bit to bit, uh, before you can say you've really transformed the space. But man, every bit does make a difference, doesn't it, huh? Look at this. There's barely even a sidewalk here. Ugh. I think these, yeah, these are non-American examples. But, you know, streets exist outside of America. So I guess that's fair. Oh, isn't this the place that Not Just Bikes is referring to? Yeah, Copenhagen. Yeah. Not Just Bikes has talked about this specific square. This is like a historic square. Some of the buildings here are quite old. Um, and then for like several decades, it was just a fucking parking lot. Let's test the popularity of bike lanes by putting in exactly one for half a mile somewhere. Yeah, literally. Literally. Like, Los Angeles bike lanes. You know? The LA County bikeways map. Oh, thank you, LA County government. Fucking embarrassing. Look at this. What's the difference between uh, purple and green? Uh, purple is bike lane or bike route. And then green is bike path. I don't know the particulars. I know this seems like a lot, but what you have to understand is that LA County is approximately the size of the United States of America. So like, let, let's, let's zoom in on a human level, shall we? Oh. Yeah, I bet you thought like, oh, that's like two streets across, right? <laughs> uh, sir, we've, 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 bu <laughs> we've built this bike lane right here on this street and no one's using it where is the bike lane what what of this is the bike lane it's down was i too far up uh there we is it this is a sidewalk the car is parked in it ah uh, okay classic satellite image might be old yeah it might be just saying like it's not enough to just build a bit you know the the really annoying thing is is that uh in in like a sane world um Los Angeles would actually be an amazing city to bike in because the weather is basically as good as weather can be on Earth. It's basically perfect weather. And most of Los Angeles is flat. Um, in, in like a sane world, Los Angeles would be an insanely good biking city. You know, like there are there are biking cities where the, the, the lakes freeze over in the winter. You know, it's fucking cold. LA is so fucking hot, Vosh, what the fuck? Dude, people, the kinds of people who like biking sometimes like biking in the heat, okay? It's fine. Also, biking is cooling. Because the, uh, the wind whips at you. There we go, guys, we found it.
We found the bike lane that a car is parked in. We found it. It's it's actually how you find the bike lane in Los Angeles. It's whichever lane the car is parked in. Oh, sorry, wait, never mind. The bike lane is this thing between the white lines. This is what bikers refer to as the kill zone, okay? This is great. This tiny, insubstantial bike lane that's designated by nothing more than a white line that cars have to cross in order to park or take a right turn. It's the it's the suicide lane. But this is this is the standard for American uh, bike infrastructure in a lot of places where they're just like, oh, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll take the wide shoulder on like the leftmost lane or rightmost lane or whatever, and we'll like paint a two foot wide strip that you can drive down, you know? Oh no, Mr. Arrow, this is common. This is the, the guys, raise your hand if you've seen bike infrastructure that looks like this. Because, it, yeah, it's, it's literally all over the place. This right here is Seattle's biking map, which is, admittedly, a lot better. Seattle, ca oh, well, can't handle zooming that well. Uh, Seattle is a much smaller city in terms of both population and uh, square miles, like significantly smaller. Um, so this is uh, uh, proportioned a lot better. I haven't seen bike infrastructure that doesn't look like that. Yeah, it's not exactly common. Where's your house? Um, the CIA base is underground. Even if I pointed out where it was, like, topographically, it wouldn't tell you the depth or how to get to the tunnel. Um, Seattle, Seattle has far better bike infrastructure than LA for the most part. Um, here are some good examples of things they do better. So, this is a two-lane bicycle lane. This is down in downtown. It's also designated with green, and also they have ballards uh, to block this area off. Also, and this is critical, the cars park on the other side of the bike lane. Now, the car will only cross in the bike lane's path if it needs to take a left or a right or whatever. But also, as you can see here in the light, bikes get their own light. This is pretty common in Seattle's downtown area, meaning that uh, uh, like bikes aren't like basically a pedestrian plus or whatever. They're their own type of traffic, and that prevents cars from turning when bikes are capable of going. Uh, so that's a pretty significant improvement. This is in the uh, downtown area. There are some stretches of bicycle infrastructure in Seattle, which are either um, downtown or in the Capitol Hill area, where all the homosexuals are, where they have the bike lane uh, designated not just by ballards, but by actual, like, concrete. This is very important because it is virtually impossible for a car to accidentally cross this raised two foot wide concrete barricade. Uh, you know, the car would have to be trying to do that. That would take effort. You can achieve the same uh, outcome, but prettier uh, with uh, plants planted. Because again, you would have to be un unimaginably uh, inattentive to not see this, you know? This is quite, ooh, this is new. Look at that. That looks pretty good. Separated by like six feet of stuff. Got a nice clear asphalt path. Very distinct visually. Um, very, very good. Like that a lot. Oh yeah, you have the cute little look sign right over here. This is delicious. It's, it's a lot better than LA. Uh, that's for sure. Um, oh, by the way, I really, I, I, look at how base this image is right here, where a significant portion of downtown traffic has been shoved to the side to have this gigantic protected two-way bicycle lane, which is, in America, this is like as good as you're going to get for bicycle infrastructure, because this is completely safe. It is basically impossible, like, this is safe. Look, you can even see the bicycle light up there. That's the bicycle light. Um, that's pretty good. And then you know what the title of the article attached to this image is? Drivers confused by new downtown Seattle bike lanes. Fuck you, drivers. I have driven down this road. There is nothing even remotely confusing about it. It's just less lanes. Fuck you. This is what I mean about, like, all of these octogenarian fucking suburbanites turn up to screech anytime anything good happens in a city. Because the thing is, people in the suburbs don't think of a city as a place where people live. 
they think of it as a place where they do their shopping. So cities are gutted by the disproportionately wealthy people on city councils who tend to live in suburbs, not in cities because they don't want to be around poor or homeless people, and they tear apart cities to make them driving destinations for people outside of the city. Whereas there are people who, you know, live in the city who would like to have a city to live in, ideally, maybe, possibly. I like Seattle and I want to show it off. This is uh, Broadway, which is a, um, a very gay street, lots of gays here, full of homosexuals. You can see all the trans people just driving by, where they have not only a gigantic uh, two-way bicycle lane, but it's also protected by concrete. Look, it's like being treated seriously. Look. Wow. It's, it's, like, it's like being treated like an actual mode of transportation. And I do see bicyclists on Broadway pretty often. The trolley buses in Seattle are really cool. They are, but the big problem with them is that they share the road with cars. They should have their own lane is the problem. Um, if, they, if, if they're capable of being blocked by vehicle traffic, then they're basically just a slower and less maneuverable form of, uh, of, of, of a car. And here we go. Last one I'll show. So this is, this is also on Broadway, and this is what I would consider to be the gold standard of, like, American public transportation. Watch this, guys, okay? Uh, can everyone please put a condom on so when you bust, it doesn't stain your, uh, your clothing? Okay, thank you. Now that everyone's ready. Get ready for it. On the right-hand side, we have freshly paved, double-lane bicycle infrastructure protected by multiple feet of a concrete wall, fencing, and sidewalk on which benches have been placed so people can wait for the tram that stops here. You can see the tram lines right here on this side of the road. So you, you, you cross this little path, wait here at the benches, not, uh, 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 you know, just like shuffled against the businesses, but in your own space and the tram stops right here. That right there is pretty, that's pretty, that's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with this. I just stained my pants, goddammit. I just burst the condom. You should have told me to wear two. I'm sorry. You're right. I'm sorry. That's my fault. Dang, I just shot a hole in the drywall. <laughs> Most of Seattle is not this good, but I will give credit where credit's due. Uh, the areas where real effort has been put in, it shows. Um, it really does show. And yeah, you can see over here that bicyclists have like very heavily painted green to distinguish their space. Uh, they have their own light um, up here. And the car parking, where it's present, is on the other side of the bicycle lane. This took me a while to get used to when I moved to Seattle because the idea of cars parking effectively in the middle of the road was very strange to me. I don't think there should be parking allowed here. Keep in mind, I would still go more radical than this. Um, but the fact that there's only a couple spaces and it's on the other side of the bicycle lane is so fucking based, man. What's better, trams or buses? Uh, there are benefits to both. Um, but trams are kind of worthless if they don't have their own lane. Like, buses are very versatile. Trams are good in very specific lines and routes and stuff, but, like, they need to have their own lane that they can travel up and down. That's the whole point, right? Because trams can do things that buses can't. So, Vosh, is your solution primarily underground parking for cars? Well, less car use in general. Make cities easier to get around without cars. But also, yes, um, underground lots are way, 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 way better than street parking. Like, Underground lots are expensive to build, sure, for sure, but you can pack, like, hundreds of cars into one underground lot, whereas if you had all those cars taking up street parking, that's, like, an insane amount of space that's being taken up by empty aluminum bricks, you know, um, which, is, which is just not good. And I know this area, so I can tell you for a fact there are underground lots here. There's an underground lot right down here below the QFC, and there's an above-ground lot right over here above the QFC. Uh, there are other lots here as well, um, but those are the ones I always use when I drive down to Capitol Hill. Yes, public land use for private car storage is absolutely bad policy, 100%. Have you considered buying a bike? Yeah, I've considered it, for sure. Um, the issue is that while I promote people using bikes and bike infrastructure, um, I am myself just not a very outdoorsy person, so I need a little bit more motivating, like, personally. Like, keep in mind, my argument here isn't everyone ride a bike to save the planet or whatever. My argument is the city should incentivize bike riding to the point where it is more convenient than using cars. That's what I want. I, I want 
I want people to not use cars, not because they feel like morally obliged to go with other options. I want people to not use cars because they'll be like, why the fuck would I use a car? Like, I want it to be like New Yorkers or whatever. I want people to be like, why would I, are you fucking kidding? Pay eight trillion a month for a parking space and then drive out in this, this wall to wall traffic to get to the place I could walk to in five minutes. Why would I ever do that? You know, that's what I want people to do with, with bicycling, um, and, and with trams and with buses and so on. Um, but I've still considered it, you know, I've still considered it and be good exercise as well. Yeah, Posada, Sean, there's always going to be like case by case scenarios and, and differences here. The bedrock in Seattle is pretty reliable. So, um, what's your opinion on motorcycles? Sickening. Motorcycles are uh, good for space storage, but most people park motorcycles in car spaces anyway. So they take up about the same amount of space. And also they're very dangerous and they're potentially very loud. People are like 10 times as likely to die in a motorcycle accident. They are good for traffic, yes. Personally, if I think that if you're going to go that route, if you want like, okay, nobody needs a motorcycle driving around a city, right? If you really want to snake around traffic that effectively, fucking get a Vespa or something. Get like a, an electric scooter or an electric bike or something like that. Not speaking to my fully coolie bias here or whatever, but Vespas are actually unironically the coolest and cutest vehicles ever made. This is like, this is like peak urban vehicular industrialism. Uh, it's adorable and I love it. It's so cute. I love it. It's so cute. They're so cute. Unfortunately, they're also not very safe. Um, like motorcycles, the problem, the problem with the safety of Vespas isn't Vespas. The problem with the safety of Vesta, Vespas is cars. That's always the issue, right? Because like, if it was, if everyone was riding around a Vespa, what happens if you hit another Vespa? I mean, certainly it would hurt. And of course, potentially it could be, you know, fatal. I mean, you're riding around a Vespa, but like, if you're in a Vespa and you get hit by a car, oh yeah, good fucking luck, buddy. <laughs> and that's the issue, right? It's like the, the cars, they ruin everything for everyone else. Anti-tank Vespa. Here we go. Listen, all right. If a um if a, a crossover SUV is hurtling towards you and you're in a Vespa, make it a both of you problem. All right, this is like the bicyclist strapping a pro uh, strapping a propane tank to their uh, uh you know to their chosen vehicle. All right, make it an everyone problem. This is how we prevent people from taking cars. Yeah, yeah. I love these. Check out these e-bikes. Um, I I think that yeah, modern e-bikes. Modern e-bikes have gotten really good. Um, I, I, I like them a lot. I've seen some people use them. Um, shut up. I've seen some people use them. Like, you, you know those really annoying, like, green, stupid rideshare app ones you see all over the place? Like, that's annoying as fuck, but because of the rideshare part, not because of the bike part, you know? All you really need for an electric bike to make cycling around a lot easier is a relatively small charge. A healthy human can provide a significant amount of the effort for most bicycling. And with a good bicycle, you'll coast on, on flat ground or any downhill slope. Uh, but if you're going up about like, because so, Seattle has some pretty steep hills. So for Seattle, like maybe you just want to get some groceries. So you have like a basket in the back or something. And you're like, okay, well, I can bicycle to the grocery store because it's a little bit downhill. But going back up, uphill, eh. And it's like, oh, okay, well, here's an electric bike. An electric bike costs like 1 20th of what a new car costs. Uh, and it will help you go back up the uphill. And it will be like pretty effortless, you know? You know what I'm talking about, right? Like, doesn't that sound nice? Yeah. <laughs> Cars gave me a lot of space in my last bike, Aaron. Hell yeah. Should electric bikes slash scooters be banned from bike lanes? Scooters should not be in bike lanes. Uh, electric bikes can be, yeah. Well, when I say electric bike, keep in mind, what I'm talking about here is not like one of those fucking ultra super power, like souped up basically a scooter electric bikes or whatever. There are electric bikes that literally just give you like a bit of a boost at the times that you need it. And like this, like this thing, I, okay, tell me if I'm wrong. This will not make you go that much faster than a human can pedal, right? Because humans can pedal bikes pretty fucking fast. Like humans can, can, can book it. Wrong? Well, let me check, okay? Speed of human on bike average. This is going to be pretty rough, but 
average speed at 13 miles per hour. Okay, sure. 13. Okay. Um, electric bike speed. An e-bike will give assistance when you pedal up to 20 miles per hour. Once you reach 20 miles per hour, the motor will cut off and any higher speeds will come purely from your muscle strength. That sounds fine to me. I know 20 miles an hour is faster than 13, sure, but like this is a solvable problem, right? Okay, I see. There are different speed restrictions on different classes of electric bike. Tier 1 electric bikes get cut off at 20 miles an hour, but cl or class 3 get cut off at 28 miles per hour. So this would be, I don't think this should be riding around in a bike lane. 28 miles per hour is way the fuck too fast to be going around in a bike lane. But I know humans can pedal at 20 miles per hour, especially going downhill. I think that class 1 sharing space with bike lanes is, uh, is totally fine. Also, yeah, you don't have to go that fast. Like, even a hu like you can be on a human-powered bike and still be going too fast for a bike lane, right? Bike lanes aren't for daredevils trying to go from A to B at record speed. Bike lanes are for people to use bikes in that space. Treating a bike lane like the space where you go as fast as possible on your bike would be like treating a car lane as the space where you can go as fast as possible in your car, which it's not. You'll die, and they will arrest your corpse if you do that. people do that, then they should be arrested. I, hey, I am completely in favor of speed limits on bicyclists. 100 percent oh no, full stop, 100%. You can't put like speed bumps on a bicyclist for obvious reasons, but like if there's some dude on an electric bike booking it at 32 miles per hour in the bike lane, absolutely, 100%, yeah. You would do the same thing if a person was running down a sidewalk with like their shoulders out charging into people, wouldn't you? Like, fuck that. How do you enforce that? There's no speedometers on bikes? Well, like, I, I, you, I'm talking like ideally how this would work, okay? How are you going to catch them? Well, obviously it's America. The cop would just start shooting with their gun, okay? There are speedometers on a bike? Well, there you go. I'd like to ride an e-bike, yeah. Everyone gets when I'm coming. Well, you, we, all, we all get it, right? Just can you imagine how nice it would be if that was like a real option? Oh, yeah, man. Like, all over America. Because the people who live here, this is downtown, the people who live here, um, or here, oh, guys, this is the uh, tram stop we saw from a different angle. Oh, no, this is a different tram stop. Where's the, this, look, see this? This right here is the next tram stop, I'm pretty sure. It's the same road, see? But, like, the people who live in this area have the options that I'm talking about. But wouldn't it be nice if... How much does an electric bike cost? Okay. It just auto-filled Costco. Electric bike cost. Two to three thousand dollars. Is that a lot? Absolutely. But you know how much a car costs? A hell of a lot more. Not to mention maintenance and fuel. Topping up a, a, a full fuel tank is what? Like a hundred bucks these days or something? I mean, it depends on the car, of course. Um, and, and where you live. Uh, and, and maintenance for a car, you better fucking hope that your car never has any issues because like dealing with an issue on your car will cost almost as much as the fucking e-bike, you know, like, oh, your transmission shot. Oh, good luck. I'm going to use the fucking economic value of one e-bike fixing your shit. I mean, you can get decent cars for like a thousand euros. Yeah, but maintenance too and fuel just guys, just come on, work with me here. Imagine you live in a beautiful mixed use zoning area the bottom floor of your building is cafes and hobby shops and clothing shops and there's a shoe store with like a really nice shoe that you want and you want to go get some groceries and because you live in an urbanized pedestrianized area your grocery store is like four blocks away but you can't walk back with the groceries that's, that's a lot to walk back with but you do have an e-bike with one of those like two-tier baskets in the back that you can fit like four grocery bags in. And you know, that's, that's if you make a grocery run like every three or four days, then that's easy peasy. You go in there, you buy your shit. Shit doesn't cost a ton because we live in a proletarian state and the bourgeoisie don't extract massive profits from the uh, artificially enforced inflation. You know, uh, you, 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 you salute to a uh, framed portrait of Stalin uh, that's hung above the uh, doors you exit. 
you stack all of that in your your e-bike basket you go right back on home and then you fuck your hot ass girlfriend that's also gonna be on the table and the, you're all fit as hell you're not lard asses because you bike everywhere so your legs are strong for thrusting and you have a six pack because you don't sit in a car all day and you can go for hours because your air your, the, your lungs haven't been polluted with the choked air of car exhaust because everyone bicycles in the city and everything is good and life is good this will happen to every single human if we just build more bike lanes is what i'm saying cycling is great for sex yeah unironically ah yes the lung capacity limit of sex what, what do you mean yeah if you're going hard enough yeah you can get winded yeah for sure I mean, maybe, maybe not if you're, you're doing like the ergonomically optimized doggy style position where all you have to do is sort of rotate your body on the axis of your knees by five degrees. But like, yeah, for sure. If you're, if you're doing the high level stuff, there is a style of American suburbia that is irredeemably cursed and blighted and it's over and it never even began. Uh, however, there are uh, styles of suburbs that have existed for a long time that have existed um uh, uh uh you know even before the car um hold on chicago suburb medium density here we go like this this is an example of the type of suburb uh low re low res image but okay um this is how suburbs used to be built and can still be built Rather than focusing on everybody having a gigantic lawn that takes up an ungodly amount of space, you focus on medium density zoning. That is to say, it's mostly residential and it's mostly quiet. You know, it's not like this big mixed use super urban area, though there are mixed use blocks. Um, but you can walk outside and you can immediately access a lot of important stuff, you know, within a, a short range of your house. Yeah. Short of bulldozing existing suburbs and starting over, then what the fuck do we do with the ones we have right now? Bulldoze and start over. Sorry, but the American suburban model is unfixable. No, I I, I mean that. Um, th like stuff like this, anything remotely in this ballpark, it's it's not it, it, it's unfixable. It's over. The skull shape of this neighborhood, the the carthenal tilt is too high. Uh, the chin is too low. The jawbone is not shaped right. It's all over. It might as well lay down and rot. Um, yeah. Sorry. I I yeah. Uh, it's, you know, sometimes fixing stuff means tearing stuff down, and that's what needs to be done here. There's no fixing this. It, it, effectively, fixing this would literally require more time, effort, and resources than carpet bombing it and building something new on the rubble. Like, I, like li that. this is so... It, like, nothing of this can be salvaged. Why do you hate grass? I'm very online. I wanted to give another positive example of a medium density suburb. Actually, I wanted to give a few positive examples. Um, I'm pulling these examples from Chicago because Chicago has a good history of this. Uh, but there are plenty of cities on the East Coast that are like this. And you know why they're on the East Coast? Because they were suburbs built before cars. West Coast suburbs um, were pretty much all, all of them, built after cars and built with them in mind. Uh, not the case with East Coast suburbs, so there's a lot more diversity in how they're uh, structured and styled. I think this looks quite nice personally, uh, but I'm very fond of this one. This is from Montreal, actually. And here you can kind of see the vibe, right? You have this mixed-use suburban stuff, and then right here you have a bicycle lane with a lady bicycling, and then you have a protected path. Uh separate lights, and then you have cars. This would be the edge of the suburb because this is a larger road, of course, but you get what I'm talking about. Vosh, please stop pretending people don't have children that have cheer practice or work in the opposite side of the city from where they live. Not everyone works in their own home. Not everyone is childless just trying to... Zigabiz, come on. I feel like you're reading into what I've said, stuff that I'm not saying. I'm not saying we should ban cars. Cars have, like, a reason to exist. I, I'm not one of those people who thinks they should be made literally impossible. But let's be real here, okay? A significant, overwhelming portion of car uses are not people like, you know, transporting 500 pounds of lumber or getting their kids like something or other, you know. Um, and if you if you want to like move around with your family, like uh, good trams and public transportation would probably make that a lot more accessible to a lot of people. And if you really do want a car like that's fine. I just don't think that all of the city should be dedicated to car use. 
Also, keep in mind that traffic would be a lot less uh, 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 horrible in a world where people have options other than driving. Like, it's not like, Zigabiz, it's not like you're living it up in a system right now that makes things easy for drivers. Vosh, no amount of buses can get me across a city in 15 minutes. That is not, well, whoa, 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 hold on. A good, robust train or tram system could get you across a city way faster than a car could during rush hour, or even during not rush hour. 100%, yeah. In fact, cities that have uh, incredibly high rates of, like, um, uh, 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 like worker mobility and trans-city uh, transportation, like, percentages, like Tokyo, uh, usually have really robust transportation networks to facilitate that, and not cars. It is true that not everyone is just like a shiftless 20 something who can who can zoom around. Uh Zigabus says we have those have used them. They go about 5 minutes between stops. They would more than double my commute. Do you do you Zigabus do you feel you're being perhaps a little self-centered here? Like we're talking about sweeping changes that would improve things for a vast majority of people. I'm sure the circumstances could accommodate whatever need you would have to travel across the city. Like, I don't, I don't think it would be like, oh, we've made all these changes and now you, like I've said, like driving is not banned. Fewer people will be on the road. Also, do you really think that the bus system that you have is the bus system that I would endorse? No, because I agree with you, but the vast majority of adults have kids in these responsibilities. Yeah, so the kids can come on public transportation or cars if need be, or they can walk. Or families can bike together. It's not like that doesn't happen all across the world. Boss, you're backpedaling? I haven't backpedaled. Dino Smash, do you know what a stun lock is? Bosch prioritizing walking is kind of ableist. Like there aren't people who can walk as easy. I think that's a bullshit excuse. The idea that like the the nature of first of all, I can prioritize whatever the hell I like. Second of all, the idea that like car traffic in its current form is like how, do, how would one describe it, right? It's like all disabled people and people like grandmothers or whatever. That's bullshit. Like, look in the cars around you as you drive down the interstate or as you're stuck in traffic. You are not sharing the road with a bunch of people who, like, are physically incapable of traveling or whatever. If you're disabled, then you know what we should have? You know what we should have? Dutch disability car. In the Netherlands, they have these micro cars that travel slowly and can travel on bike paths. These are given out by the government. If you're disabled and literally cannot bike or walk comfortably, congratulations, this takes up about as much space as a person sitting down on the ground. You can be given one for free. They are inexpensive. They travel not very fast at all. They can use the bike lanes. You can zip around real good. Here we go. Look at how little space these take up. Look at that. There, there's one next to a bicycle and a normal sedan. And keep in mind, the average car in America these days is not a sedan. It's a fucking SUV. You can zip zoom. Does it have AC? I, I, I assume. I don't know why it wouldn't. Though it is in the Netherlands. So maybe they felt they didn't need it. But we can build it with AC. I mean, that's doable. See, look. Like if you've got a wheelchair or whatever. Beep, beep. These are better for disabled people than vehicles because these have direct and uh, uh, clear access to um, bicycle parking and bicycle lanes, which means that people in wheelchairs or people who are hobbling or whatever uh, have the option to get closer to where it is they need to go rather than being channeled through the regular um, car traffic. Oh, it's swaggy as hell, Harris. Also, pardon me for coming across a little bit harsh here, but I'd be willing to bet we would have a lot less disabled people if they weren't, like, like, f fuck ton of lard asses who get all of their outdoor time in a vehicle. <laughs> I'm sorry. A, a, a world in which people are, like, the only way to get around is by sitting in a, in, a, in a fucking car and get around probably contributes substantially to poor health. Um, walking and biking around would probably do a lot to keep the average person a lot healthier and is considered, like, a public good. Or ran over by cars. Yeah, that too. This is an L take. No, it's not. What I'm saying is absolutely the case. Like, there's a reason why we're all getting fatter. And a lot of it is because people just literally fucking drive everywhere. Don't say that like it's edgy. We have the stats. No, it's literally true. I'm not making it up. That's literally true. Yeah, like, of course, obviously, there were health consequences to the main mode of transportation going from what it was for all of human history, which was walking 
Or maybe if you were wealthy, you had like a carriage you could go on. And that's why wealthy people were fat back 500 years ago or whatever. Um, and nowadays, like anytime anyone wants to go anywhere, they pack themselves into a 4,000 pound aluminum and steel monster uh, that, that, that belches fucking greenhouse gases into the city streets while traveling over and everyone like fights over the parking spot that's six inches away from the door. So when they go to Home Depot, like they don't have to walk the additional 10 feet of the parking strip that was further away, you know, like I think there were probably health consequences to that. Yeah. People who are eating fudge rounds getting real mad with you right now. True. It does make people happier too. fight depression. Yeah, Liza Lee. Also, you could drive this beep beep silly car. Vosh, does owning a big car make you safer? In collisions with smaller cars, yes. It makes them a lot less safer, though, so it's kind of like an arms race. Check out these per acre graphs and maps. Vosh, I agree with you on literally everything but this. This is ridiculous. It's way too late to change shit, so shaming people who want cars and a nice up is stupid. Dropping the pastrami, what are you talking about? What positions are you imagining? This is this always bother this is what I mean about capitalist realism or car realism, where people are like confused and baffled by the idea of something that they have like entrenched in their mind changing. So they invent a bunch of other things to get mad at, to like justify the weird confusion they have with the concept of things changing. Nobody nobody's saying you can't have a car and a nice house. When did I even say you can't have a nice house? When did that when did that come up? If your dream, like your dream, uh your American dream is to live in a space like... Where the fuck did that go? Did I not have that saved in this set of tabs? Oh, there. If your American dream is to live in a space like this, and this is what you define as a nice house, then no. You don't get to have this, and I'm not sorry, and you're better for it. Sorry, you don't know what's good for you, and I'm taking it away from you, okay? People who live in areas like this literally have higher rates of depression and suicide. You just idealize this, because it's like the American dream shit. White picket fence. This is an image that was sold to you starting in the 1950s as a way of promoting the government project of spreading out the larger population following the post-war boom. Like this is, I, 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 no, I am taking it from you and you will be better for it. You will live in, you will live in the medium density suburb if you wish. You will not have the fence. There will be no lawn to fence in. If you want to feel grass under your feet, go to a park. It's not like people who have trimmed lawns even go on their lawns, you know? Like, nobody with a lawn spends time on their lawn, except for to trim it. Like, they don't do things with their lawn. Gardens? Lawns and gardens are different things. I respect gardens. I do not respect lawns. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a status symbol. My lawn is a garden? Then it's a garden. Have you ever mowed before? Yes. I would visit my grandparents in the summer in Florida, and they did have a gigantic lawn they never ever used for anything, and they would insist on mowing it every Sunday. They didn't do anything with it. I don't know if this was just like exercise for them or what. How do you get this through a Midwest conserva brain? Man, I don't know. How, how about the fact that like every American travels over to a European city that's been around for a thousand years goes, wow, that was so magical and cool. I loved how there were all these cool walkable areas and all these cafes and all this cool stuff to look at. And then they go back to their shitty fucking Midwest off-ramp bullshit fucking suburb project. And they're like, well, guess this is how life is. Kerhyuk. Like, the, the problem is, is that a lot, like, people have so much ideology fed to them about what makes them happy. Nobody who lives here is happy. I'm sorry. The only shit that goes on in places like this is child neglect and pedophilia. I am sorry. I'm sorry. I don't respect this. These are all, like, showboat houses bought by empty people who want big empty showrooms for them to stack shit in without knowing how or why it makes any sense. They don't, this is, this is like the Fight Club Ikea showroom of houses where people think, oh, well, a big house in the suburbs is a status symbol. Three cars in the driveway is a status symbol. Look at these driveways. They're wide enough to fit two cars next to each other. Disgusting. They don't use them. The, the woman doesn't even leave this house. The woman just stays at home and contemplates how much more fulfilling her life would have been if she had, like, stayed with that quirky artist guy that she fucked in college. Like, they, nobody's happy here, but everyone tells themselves that they're happy. People are happy in communities. This is anti-community. It's anti-human. This is demon shit. Spawn of the devil. Okay? And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with a woman wanting to be a housewife or whatever, but I'm saying she's not even doing that. She's just fantasizing about Eduardo. Okay? It's like, it's not... Vosh, a lot of suburbs are better than a lot of other neighborhoods in, some, in America. Suburbs are really bad, but there are a lot of people who live in worse places that see suburbs as an escape. Yeah, but what they see as an escape doesn't mean it's actually better. I mean, suburbs tend to have, I don't know, like, maybe less crime than, like, fucking 
crime-stricken inner city areas or whatever. But like, by what metric is this better? You 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 spend like four million dollars on a house out here, or like you you chain yourself to a mortgage for what? True is a Burbite whose parents only moved there for the house space. Six kids. They lack. They hate the lack of community. Yeah, it's fucked. Vosh, I live in one of these houses. Me, my brother, and my parents pulled out money to buy it. We have four cars we all use daily, and the lawn is for the dog to play in. We all work and are generally happy in our multi-generational household with the space for us to live in. I do wish there was a better sense community, but other than that, that's great. Great. So what you have and what you're describing, though four cars, really four cars? But okay, what you're describing right now is a multi-generational household. You have the population and the car use of multiple generations folded into a single space. So this would be an example of a justified use of like a big house, but it doesn't have to be in these shitty suburban areas. You can have urban areas that have like big housing like this, or you can live in a rural area. If you want a big house, then you got to pay the, pay the big house toll to live in a city, okay? Well, but this this type of like intermediary shit is heavily subsidized by the city. If you want a big space to live in, like, and you don't want to pay city prices, then like, the, 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 oh man, fuck. People don't know how, oh, Ooh, God damn it. People don't understand how subsidized suburbs are. Look at this. This is what I mean. Not just bikes, American cities bankrupt. He gave me permission to use this. Huge return on the job market, piece of land, and the American dream was born. This became so central to American psychology that the idea that it? suburban development provides prosperity is taken as fact by almost everyone in the country. And the same goes for Canada, too. Part of the problem is how suburban growth is financed. When the suburbs began, huge amounts of money from federal and state governments were given to cities to build out- It's this one. This is the fourth video in my Strong Town series. Watch it. Where is it? Where is it? Where's the graph? The multiple graphs. It shouldn't be hard to find. They're shown multiple times throughout the video, but I can't see it. Where is it? Where is it? Welcome to the third video in my Strong Town series. If you have no idea what Strong Towns is about, you might want to watch the first. The subsidization of suburbs. The graph that shows how much money. Where is that graph of the subsidization? It's this one. Thank you. Simple alone should be enough watch. to convince anyone that the modern car centric suburban style of development is broken but it's worth exploring this further. Does this hold up in other cities? And what happens when we bring into account the cost of servicing these properties with roads, water pipes, sewers, etc.? And that brings us back to Lafayette. This is a map of the revenue and expenses data uncovered by Urban3. So what are we looking at? Well, any successful business tracks its ROI, its return on investment. When making a decision between two competing projects, it's critical to know which one will result in the most revenue compared to the investment put into it. And too many projects with a negative return on investment That's me. could bankrupt a company. But in order to know your ROI, you need to know two things, your revenue and your expenses. Urban3 created a kind of municipal return on investment for Lafayette. This map shows the municipal revenue Ooh. per acre. So why per acre other than the fact that Americans can't use metric? Well, every property in a city needs services and the majority of services get more expensive the more spread out they are. Roads are the obvious example. The farther a parcel of land is from everything else, the more asphalt is needed to get there. The worst case scenario are culs de sac, which are basically just city subsidized driveways. This also applies to water infrastructure, sewers, and all other physical infrastructure as well Show as the it. cost of policing, fire department coverage, and even the cost of providing education. But while per area revenue is actually quite a good approximation, Urban3 wanted to fully understand these expenses, so they painstakingly calculated the cost of services for each parcel of land in Lafayette. It looks something like this. <gasps> this shows every area that's a net positive for the city in gray, and every area that's a net negative in red. 
and here it is in 3D. <gasps> this analysis has some fascinating results. The first is that downtown is wildly profitable. This is a bit surprising because there's nothing particularly remarkable about downtown Lafayette. It's certainly not bad, but you'd never know from looking at these pictures that this is the economic engine of the city, while places like this are a drain on city finances. But this shouldn't be too surprising when you think about it, because there's an insane amount of asphalt and infrastructure here for a very small number of shops. And for some bizarre reason, the Google Street View car drove down every aisle of this parking lot. But since they did it over multiple years, you can move down this way and watch the Toys R Us go out of business. Most of these profitable gray areas are the historical neighborhoods built along the river. But one of the biggest spikes is this place, a modern mixed-use walkable neighborhood called River Ranch. Uh. Places like this are a net positive for the city. Do you have any fucking idea how much money this country would have if we just built out our city sensibly? Do you have any idea? See, the, the, the fucking city of Los Angeles would be able to build fucking golden rockets to shoot at the sun every month if, with all the excess revenue they would have if they didn't have their fucking city designed by a bunch of monkeys. One of the most shocking discoveries that Strongtowns discovered is that the replacement cost of all of the infrastructure in Lafayette, something that you would expect to happen over about one generation, was about $32 billion. And that's just infrastructure, not all the other everyday costs needed to run a city. Yet the existing tax base was much smaller than that. I you love you, Notches Bikes. Everyone sub Notches Bikes, even though his channel is like three times too big. Bosch owned suburbs literally have an extremely high rate of vehicle accidents involving children because suburbs hate pedestrians. Yeah, also because fucking. Dude, these, these roads are completely unused and five miles wide and everyone in the suburbs wants to kill themselves. So everyone's going 80 miles an hour down these roads, fucking Tokyo drifting their way into the splattered bodies of the 18 children uh, who just took the six hour walk back from their elementary school. In order to bridge the difference, Strongtown's calculated that the average family in Lafayette would see their tax bill go from about $1,500 per year. To Wait, hold on. Fuck, it already went up really high. guys. So without s subsidizing suburbia, how much do you think the average city tax bill would be for the people who currently pay fifteen hundred on average for it? The nine answer is nine thousand two hundred dollars per year. Ten billion. But the median household income in Lafayette was only forty-one thousand dollars at the time. There's simply no way that can happen. But those simple averages are hiding the bigger picture of who's subsidizing who, mm -hmm. because these gray sections are the poorer areas, while these red areas are significantly wealthier. Yes. Poor inner city, urban fucking city dwellers subsidize the suburbia because the city spends jack shit on maintaining its city fucking residential area, but spends a fuck ton on the insane infrastructure necessary to, to, to put up these suburban houses. So money is being funneled from the poorest to the wealthiest. This is the big issue with suburbs, you know? Rural areas are not that economically productive, but they're nowhere near as economically destructive as um as suburbs are suburbia just shouldn't exist man i mean me medium density suburbs are fine um but like american suburbia just shouldn't exist if you have a fuck ton of kids or like a huge family or whatever you either should have several properties next to each other where you live together which is pretty easy to do if you're not separated by five miles of of of, of, of yard you know um or you sh we should have to pay the price of having a space that large in a, uh, you know, in like a, a, a urban or like medium density suburban area. Or fuck it. Maybe you guys could just do the cottage court. Maybe we just got to go the cottage court route. That's what we need. How do you avoid doomerism? Spite. Street view of my university city to make Americans in chat really depressed. Oh, don't do that to them. Don't do this to them. Come on. They're already on the... Oh my god, look at those buildings. I can't believe how ableist and anti-family and anti everyone this is because there aren't six lanes of car that we could all die in front of oh man 
there's nothing I would hate more than opening up my classic fucking French window vignettes to look out at this view and then look down and see that the, whoa, what did I click? So here's a and then look down to see that the fanciful glass portzillion store beneath me from from whence a uh, most entrancing ero odor emerge i don't know what i'm saying anymore fun quiz which of these two neighborhoods is subsidizing the other number one or number two yeah it's the first one that's subsidizing the second the poorest people in lafayette are consistently subsidizing wealthy suburbanites but i don't want to pick on lafayette here as I said at the beginning, there's nothing particularly unique about Lafayette, and these results- That's true! Let's take a look at other examples that have been provided by the Urban 3 analysis group at looking at which parts of the city are more profitable than other parts. Here's Minneapolis. Holy shit! That's cool. That's Hennepin County, not Minneapolis, but same idea. Okay, the county in which Minneapolis exists. All right, fine. Indianapolis- Jesus Christ. The point is proven, but why is it like this? Because car companies um, successfully persuaded through enormous amounts of expensive propaganda, both the government and the consumer, that the car was the futuristic standard of, of living and that all of the world should be centered around it. They deliberately lied about every element of their plans at every step of the way. They lied about uh, traffic. They lied about traffic calming. They lied about congestion. They lied about the safety of vehicles. They've lied about their emission standards. They lied about leaded gasoline. They've lied about like everything, every step along the way. And people have just accepted it and gone along with it because it's been sold to us as the American dream. This is very much a Western hemisphere problem. Like this is an issue in other parts of the world as well. But this is, we, we have a very specific relationship. 5% vacant, 11% land more than building, blue one-story buildings, green over one story or civic. You can see that strip of wealth right here in Indianapolis, right? Like, here's the downtown area, and then it, like, it goes across like this. And you can see the areas where the average building is over one story, or where the, where the, the zoning... Why is it a strip? Um, because historically, cities have usually been built out along, like, roads as major thoroughfares, whether it be a highway or whether it just be, like, the most used roads entering the city. So you have, like, descending lines of wealth coming out from this. Like, man, I, it's just like, Tokyo does so many things correct. Tokyo has such a dense network of subways that through just taking the subway, you can end up, like, within walking distance of basically any part of the city people want to go to, you know? And this is just the subway systems. We're not even talking about buses or whatever else. We're just talking about their subways where, where, where trains come every like three minutes. And keep in mind, by the way, that Tokyo itself may be very populous, but the Japanese economy has been stalling for 35 years. So it's not like Japan has like indebted itself or like Japan is, is like racked with this insane debt uh, 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 in accordance with this. I'm sure it's very expensive. Don't get me wrong. But look at what that expense has allowed for. If you Google to Tokyo, and you can all do this right now if you want, if you just Google Tokyo, you will notice something different about its streets. There's a reason why when people think of Tokyo, they think of shit like this. You know why? Because not every fucking business has to be directly connected to a fucking car. A lot of these roads, a lot of these travel like pathways are just humans walking through alleys and streets the way we have for millennia. The divergence from this is the norm. And you know what? A lot of these places, so you ask, okay, well, how do these businesses get their shipments in and out, huh? You know how they do it? A lot of these roads are accessible to vehicle traffic at certain hours of the day, and they use those adorable little uh, Japanese mini truck. They use these. So, like, okay, maybe, like, the real pedestrian traffic won't show up until, like, I don't fucking know, 7 a.m. or something. So at 5 a.m., beep, beep, this carries just as much as an American F-150, except it takes up one hundredth the size. This is no larger than an apple. Oh, look. That's a Westerner driving one. Look how cute you look in it. And they show up with their shit, and they're done. Because you don't actually need to have fucking 24-7... 
road access to a business to keep that business alive. In fact, it's the opposite. Business benefits from people being able to walk around and access their shit directly. Guys, don't, wouldn't you agree that you have gotten your most shopping done? Like you've gotten the most shopping done, not when you're driving from business to business, but when you drive to an area that has lots of businesses and you get to just walk around with like your shopping bags and you get to feel like, like, a, like a Barbie girl in a Barbie world running around. That's why we built shopping malls. The whole point of the shopping mall was that after decades of car centric development, it's like, oh shit, it turns out people don't like having to drive like between individual fucking business points. What if we had a central walkable area where people could set up shop and people could just walk between it? Shopping malls were our crutch. They were our way of trying to recapture the way human societies have been built for so long. And they suck, sure, for a wide variety of reasons, but that's why we built them to recapture that magic. You've probably noticed if you live in a city large enough to have it, but you know what's doing well? You know what's surviving the death of malls? Outdoor malls. No, seriously. There's actual data on this. If you take a look at which malls are dying and which malls aren't, the malls that are dying are these like disgusting like boxed in strip mall outlets and the ones that are doing relatively well are outdoor malls because outdoor malls are basically just a walkable commercial district it's that simple we didn't need to box it in we didn't need to enclose it all we had to do was keep it open and available to people i feel like i'm losing my mind bosh has been on this topic for two hours because i care about it yeah, running errands in the suburbs is like a two-hour ordeal driving between five different department stores. Yeah, and it's depressing. It doesn't have to be like this, man. Because if you live right here in this core in the center of the city, it's pretty likely, even in America, car-centric, uh, whatever, whatever, that you can walk around and get what you need to get to because of mixed-use zoning. We could have this everywhere. Rancho Cucamonga. That sounds like a... Funny name! Eugene, Oregon. I've been there. Look, you can see it right here, man. Yellow is single family, and uh, blue or gray or whatever is not single family. And you can see that all the areas that are marked yellow for single family are in the red. Like, every one. There's downtown here. There's downtown right here. Overwhelmingly not single family zoned. And that's where the wealth is. And then the red starts right here. And that's where the single family starts. It's like perfect one-to-one. -one. It's like it's like a button that city planners can press to bankrupt themselves. It's so fucking cool. I love the bankrupt yourself button. Uh, what's going on in Rancho Cucamonga? Because this has a relatively distributed... Are there like multiple downtowns? I don't know. I don't know anything about Rancho Cucamonga. And yet Vosh wants an SUV, so take all this with a grain of salt. Yeah, yeah. Vosh, Belgian here. Public transit is great as long as it works, but privatization has fucked it over so much. Yep, mm-hmm. It's this stuff like this, you have to fight for it. But keep in mind that a lot of the fucked up car-centric infrastructure shit you have to deal with over there comes from us. American auto companies aren't like the only auto companies in the world, far from it, but we have done so much to export car supremacy. Are city planners getting kickbacks? It, it doesn't feel like a concentrated effort to ruin pedestrianization. Okay, the reason... Okay. This is a, so the answer to this is deliciously Marxist, okay? Because that, that's the answer. It's so simple, all right? People act in accordance with their material um, conditions, but people also think in accordance with them. Wealthy people very often don't think they're like masterminds of a grand scheme to steal money from the proletariat. They think they're honest, hardworking entrepreneurs who are being rewarded fairly in an incentive system that genuinely does prioritize good behavior. The ideology is one uh, which convinces them that they are in the right, as is the case all the time. Most people don't think of themselves as monsters, after all. The reason why things turn out this way, the reason why you get devastating shit like this, is because people who do city planning are hired, or at least like, the plans are made by the city council. City councils are elected, and in our system, it's easier to get elected if you're wealthy. Wealthy people tend to live in suburbs because it is ideologically um, prioritized for people with money to get out of the city and go live in some gigantic eight-bedroom McMansion. Um, you know, American ideology has pushed that on everyone. Everyone thinks that's like the thing you do when you're wealthy. Unless you're so wealthy, you live in like a penthouse apartment in downtown, but that's like real, real, real wealth, you know. Um, so generally speaking, the people on city councils 
are just rich, old, out-of-touch assholes who don't really spend time downtown with their constituents. That's it. Really, that's it. It's not that they're evil. It's not that they're malicious. They're not trying to ruin pedestrianization. But from their perspective, cars are the only way for them to get around. They live in the suburbs. And in the suburbs where you have to drive 15 minutes to get to the grocery store, where you have to drive 30 to get to downtown to do any shopping, for them, like, yeah, of course we need car access in downtown. Of course we need wider highways. Because how else would how else would all this work? The wealthy are sheltered into a situation where they arrive at the wrong answers almost naturally. Keep in mind, though, all of the changes that I'm proposing here would be to their benefit, too. Do you know what the commute is from suburban areas, like right now, just on average? The average commute has been going up and up and up and up and up. Cities like Houston, which have spent billions, that's billions with a B, multiple b billions to expand the widest highway on Earth, are still running into increasing commute times year after year. No matter what they do, it doesn't go down. Traffic engineers have known about this for nearly a century. They call it induced demand. It's science. We know that this won't fix the problem. Uh, but the people elected to city councils aren't scientists. They're politicians, generally politicians who have a class orientation towards wrong answers and towards the needs of their wealthier constituents, their neighbors. In other words, it's a microcosm of the same problems that we face day to day in national politics. In Nashville, the average is 45 minutes to an hour average commute. Disgusting. Report and graph on commute time for you. Trend in average travel time to work from 1980 to 2013. Um, it's gone up everywhere. In New York, Maryland. Average travel time to work here in California is 25 minutes, which means it's 25 minutes back as well which means 50 minutes a day in the car. Over here in the Midwest, where there are very few people, the uh, numbers are uh, a lot lower. But even then, not by a tremendous amount. Still 30 minutes like in the car, you know? Texas, I imagine, is skewed out. I wonder what... Well, hold on. Houston commute time, because this is like a state average. But what about... What about a city? Because cities are where it really is. Average commute time in Houston is 26.1 minutes, while 5.8% of Houstonians face a severe commute of 60 minutes or more. 5.8% of Houstonians. Uh, Houston population, 2.3 million. So 6% of 2.3 million, what would that be? About 1. Point, uh, wait, uh, uh, 110,000? Well, that's no, 110, 110 130. 120, 120, 130,000 or so people, more than an hour commute. Insane. Los Angeles. Average commute in LA, 53.68 minutes. But that's each day, not both ways. Apparently, the average national commute, according to this 2017 CBS article, is 49.1 minutes. That's the average American, period. For people who commute, the average American across the board, 330 million people in this country, the average commute, 49.1 minutes a day. Actually insane. And it's only gotten worse with time. It's only gotten worse. This is what people talk about when they talk about a 15-minute city. And keep in mind, a 15-minute city is 15 minutes drive. That's not even a radical proposal. I want everything you need in life to be within 15 minutes of walking. Is it not a 15-minute walk? To be honest, I've heard both. A 15-minute walk, everything being within a 15-minute walk, is doable in many like urban or medium-density areas. But for a lot of Americans, obviously, that's not quite doable. Uh, people in suburbia or in rural areas are going to have to... Uh, Vosh, New York's rail system is also about 40 to 60 minutes. 40 to 60 minutes for what? To get from where to where? You mean like commutes over the rail system? Oh yeah, Paris is great for walkability. Is this one way? This is both ways. People go where they get paid the most. Everything is so expensive. Then why don't we zone out the economically productive areas? Like, we just, we just saw that with the buttons. The, the, the make money slash lose money buttons with the zoning. Like, there are buttons that they placed right here that makes this the print money button. 
that they could they could click elsewhere and make more mo like literally mixed zoning is ju is just like a solution it li like literally just like whoo like it just it just works you know you're just rambling at this point that's true editors keep it all in i don't want you to cut a single second but you're right we're moving on uh okay can you explain it in DD &D terms yes all of america is difficult to write Vosh, thanks to trains, Tokyo startup restaurants cost less to eat at, to the point of being cheaper to eat out than to cook at home hypers. Oh, is that really be thanks to trains? I did notice that in Tokyo, I could get a full meal for the equivalent of $7, like at a good restaurant. It was kind of wild. I went into like, th th there was all this bamboo decor, and I had a like three course meal for I think 762 yen. So, uh, uh, d did I tip? I don't remember if you tip in Tokyo. If I could tip, I did tip, whatever. But the cost of the meal after tax was 700 something yen, which was like seven bucks. And it was like a full fucking meal, like a, like a, like a proper multi-course thing, you know? You don't tip in Japan? Okay, then I didn't. Tokyo Price Restaurant. I'm sure it's gone up since then, of course. It's been like a decade since I was there, but still. R to me, stop bullying Pigeon, okay? Pigeon has to bully Ruben. You can bully Ruben too, but don't bully Pigeon. How does your fat ass feel about fully pedestrianized spaces? Get some exercise, you tubby fuck. 